welcome this morning or about this afternoon um, to everyone joining us. This is the advanced training series for MedPlus. This is session five. We're going to be covering fire weather with a little bit of a twist. So if you're here for session four, which was two weeks ago, um, we covered fire weather. Um, but this time we're going to look at some of the advanced um, data sets uh, involved with fire weather. Uh, for those of you who have played around with Python embedding, this is going to be kind of your bread and butter here. Um, Dan is going to take us through um, the capabilities within MetPlus uh, via Python embedding and the Python capabilities. Um, then we're going to shift over to George, um, who's also on the MetPlus team. He's going to tell us a little bit about how we worked with some fire data that was provided by Amanda um, and how we went through with Python. We're able to dice up and send it over to MetPlus for analysis. And uh, Amanda will be able to tell us a little bit about what those results look like, how they'll be used, and future iterations um, of using MetPlus with uh, fire weather data of these kinds of sorts. Um, and I think uh, Tara might be able to wind us up with how um, SFS and fire weather are going to be playing together and future capabilities of that sort. So without too much further ado, I think we've got everybody um, that will be joining today. Um, Dan, if you want to kick us off and have us uh, learn a little bit more about Python embedding. Sure. Thanks, John. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, as John said, my name is Dan Adrianson. Um, I'm a scientist that works with the MET team at NCAR, um, and I'm heavily involved in the Python um, integration capabilities and applications within uh, MET and MET Plus wrappers. Um, so let me uh, share my slides um, a second. And I have a presentation this morning to cover um, some background and overview of the different uh, capabilities within MET Plus for Python embedding. Uh, let me see if I can enter. Slideshow, can someone on the team or anybody online confirm that yep, it's shown you're up. seeing? OK, great. Thank you. Um, and I'll just say before I get started that um, I'm happy to answer questions or uh, provide clarification during this time. Um, by all means, don't consider this formal um, in any sense of the term. Um, and likewise, if any of the team online uh, has anything to add, feel free to jump in or interrupt me. That, that is perfectly fine. Um, and I'd just like to say that um, while I am giving the presentation, of course, this is a uh, an effort that's much bigger than me um, from all of the software engineering staff um, and, and additional scientists that, that provide support for these types of integration. I just want to acknowledge the rest of the team, um, both at NCAR um, and at NOAA GSL and within the De Developmental Testbed Center, or DTC. So just a little bit of background about what what we mean when we say Python embedding. Um, Python embedding was developed, I think, around MET version, I want to say 8.0 or so, um, at the very, very first um, um, instantiation of it. And it, initially, it was uh, designed as a mechanism for passing data to the MET tools. Um, this is typically data that the MET tools can't directly read on their own. Um, so most of you on the call probably are familiar that MET requires CF compliant NetCDF, uh, MET style NetCDF, um, GRIB or GRIB2 input, um, and, and a few other file formats. But if your file formats that you're trying to use deviate from that, um, historically, we've had to work with um, those folks to provide direct software support to read those files. Um, with Python embedding, that has uh, broadened not only the types of files that we can support, but um, enabled users to provide that support themselves. Um, the other thing that this allows is it allows users to uh, create novel derived fields that aren't available in input data. So let's say you even you know you have a, a data file that has um, that that Matt can read, um, but it doesn't have the field or the um, you know the data that you want to use for your verification workflow. Um, by using Python, you can read in the data, create that derived field, and hand it off to Matt. Um, for verification um, um, without having to write out another file that MET then has to read in. So what types of data can MET receive um, from Python embedding? Um, we currently support uh, three types of data, um, two-dimensional arrays of gridded data. Um, so this would be um, like a forecast uh, field on a two-dimensional array um, that you provide to GridStat or PointStat. Um, we also uh, support point observations, 
um, in a nested Python list format, which follows Met's 11 column format. For those of you familiar with the um, 11 column format of observation data that Met uses. And we also provide support for um, etched pair data. Um, and this only applies to the MPR um, line type uh, or matched pair line type definition. We'll, we'll talk about um, each three of these uh, data sets in more detail um, later on. So just a little bit of background, I, I alluded to this a little bit, but but I really wanted to to spend one more slide um, highlighting, you know, what this what this Python embedding allows users to do. Um, really, it, it 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 provides a possibility to support endless file formats. If there exists a way in Python to read the data, generally speaking, it can be reformatted in Python in the way that Met expects and can be passed to Met. And that, in and of itself, is just extremely powerful. Um, you know, we've we've had lots of use cases developed with this capability um, and myriad data sets um, from all over the Earth system science uh, uh, realm uh, for all sorts of different verification efforts. And it's really exciting. Um, but in addition to that, as I alluded to, um, it can allow a user to perform uh, data manipulation. So derivations and calculations, but also um, data cleaning and data formatting. Um, if you need to manipulate the data in any way, that's maybe not creating a drive field, um, but maybe you need to perform some transformation of the data or um, mask out data, um, other things. Um, I mean, MET can do that type of thing too, but if you have a file format that MET can't read, you know, certainly these other things you can do in Python as well. Um, one additional advantage is um, in certain cases and workflows, it does eliminate or reduce the need for intermediate data files on disk. Um, so by uh, passing data in memory um, from Python uh, to the MET tools, you can sometimes avoid the need to uh, write out uh, additional files. Um, and most importantly, um, or, or I think most importantly, it, it, it really provides a, a conduit to connect the MET Plus um, ecosystem to the Python ecosystem. So you, you get access to packages like X-Ray, Pandas, um, MetPy, um, really anything that, that is out there um, and has a Python module, um, it, it opens the door for you as a user to, to access. So I created this graphic, which is just kind of like a pared down um, Met 11.1 uh, wire diagram. And I've sort of zoomed in um, on the areas where uh, Python embedding um, currently is supported. Um, so the red um, uh, squares here show um, data set entry points where uh, Python could be used to provide data instead of a data file. Um, and then the magenta boxes show the MET tools um, that can currently interact with those data. Um, I, I missed a few here with the magenta boxes, but the ASCII to NC, point to grid, plot point obs, and plot data claims and stat analysis should be in the magenta boxes too. But um, Anyways, I just wanted to kind of provide this overview um, just to give you uh, uh, a sense of the, the MET software ecosystem and, and where these uh, Python embedding capabilities exist and, and the entry points into the, um, into the software suite, just to, before we go into the details to kind of give a big picture view. So let's talk a little bit about some Python embedding requirements. Um, it, I'd be remiss not to talk about how to get um, this capability enabled on, on your end. So um, it really starts with compiling the MET software. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details, but there is an enable Python compilation flag, um, and the documentation for uh, compiling the MET software covers this in detail. Um, but what that does is links the MET C++ software um, with a Python installation. Um, and uh, we require Python 3.10.4 or above right now. And the Python installation that you use when you compile your MET software must include the NumPy, Pandas, X-Array, and NetCDF4 packages. Um, so that's sort of like the minimum um, requirements that the, your Python installation here has to have. Um, you can certainly have more uh, Python packages installed. And any Python packages installed in this installation that you use when compiling the MET software will be available to you when you write your Python script to use uh, with Python embedding. Um, there's a special case we'll talk about later. Um, if you build MET uh, with a version of Python and discover later you need an additional Python module, there's ways around that without having to recompile MET. Um, 
and, and we'll go into those details a little bit. And then I just show an example here. Um, uh, I already mentioned MetPy. Uh, that's a pretty popular um, weather and meteorology uh, Python package from uh, Unidata. Um, and we frequently interact with the uh, H5Py um, Python package for some users with uh, HDF5 um, data file formats. So let's break it down um, by the types of data sets. Um, and we'll start by talking about gridded data first. And these slides are really about how to get the Python embedding to work when you're calling the MET tools. Um, we'll talk a little bit about your Python script requirements for each data set as well in each section. Um, but I want to start out with what a command looks like, because I think that's most familiar um, to most users. Um, so in this case, we're going to start with gridded data. Um, and uh, the, the uh, black box here contains a typical grid stat command. And for those of you familiar with grid stat, it's typically um, grid stat and then the forecast file, the obs file, the config file, and then any other optional arguments you want. Here I provide the output directory. And in this case, um, we're going to provide forecast data via Python instead of a, of a data file. And so here, your command would change to substitute your forecast file with a Python keyword. And there's two Python keywords that we support, and one is Python NumPy, and the other one is Python X-Array. And that depends on what type of object you have in your Python script um, that you're sending to MET. Um, so you replace the gridded data file, in this case, the forecast file is, is um, using Python embedding. The obs file um, is just a netcdf file in this case, so the uh, grid stat will obtain um, the observation uh, grid from a netcdf file, but not from Python. And this keyword um, signals to Matt to obtain data from Python rather than a data file. And then in your grid stack config file here at the bottom, um, you're going to provide the full path, it has to be the full path, um, to your Python script that you want to use, um, along with any command line arguments um, that the Python script might take. For example, um, if you wanted to pass in a time argument or a data file um, or a variable name or other things um, that you're, you're, you need uh, for your Python script to work properly in your workflow, um, that can all be provided in the double quotes here in the name entry um, of the forecast uh, field dictionary in your configuration file. So this tells uh, Matt what Python script to call um, to get data instead of which field name um, from the data file to obtain data. So again, um, I just show this again, the grid stat command and the config file. And the blue boxes highlight um, you know, how you're controlling the Python input to grid stat rather than just providing a data file and a field name from that data file. I want to point out that um, in the MetPlus wrappers, we have configuration um, options for your configuration file um, where you would put these two elements. And in this particular example, where we're providing uh, forecast data via Python instead of a data file, um, you would provide the Python keyword in the forecast grid stat input template configuration item, in this case, Python NumPy. And then in the forecast var1 name, you would provide the full path to the Python script and the two arguments um, as the uh, setting for that configuration variable name. So I just show this to kind of relate um, how you would use grid stat on the command line with Python embedding versus how you would control these two elements uh, in the MetPlus wrappers configuration file. So let's talk a little bit about your script that you would use um, to provide the forecast data from Python um, for gridded data. Um, some things to keep in mind are that this only supports 2D arrays. So um, a typical uh, grid stat case would be to provide a uh, gridded data file that is typically 3D or, or perhaps 4D, um, has multiple times, multiple vertical levels, and um, an XY uh, dimension. But for Python, we only support providing a single level from a single time or just an XY uh, two-dimensional uh, array of data. The Python variable that that 2D array of data um, is contained within must be named met underscore data. The Python variable can be a NumPy ND array, in which case you would use the Python NumPy keyword, or an X-Array data array object. And in that case, um, you would use the Python X-Array keyword. 
In either case, they must be named metadata. Um, you have to provide metadata in a Python dictionary, which is just another variable. A dictionary is a Python object, um, but the variable has to be named adders, A-T-T-R-S. Here, I've highlighted the adders that are the attributes that need to be contained in that dictionary um, and the key for each of those attributes. Um, and essentially what you're doing here in the attributes is you're telling Met um, all the information about the 2D array of data. So the valid time, the initialization time, if it's forecast data, the lead time, if it's forecast data, the accumulation interval, if it's uh, like accumulated precipitation or snowfall, um, a variable name um, of the data, a long name, what level the data represent, uh, the units. Um, you have to provide grid information as well. Um, and then optionally, you can provide a fill value that might differ from the standard um, uh, MET fill value used for um, 2D arrays. Just a note on the grid information. Um, I don't cover that here. Um, so I recommend you visit the link here in the user guide, Appendix F for the MET um, user guide. And in there, there are very detailed uh, descriptions of all of the grid attributes that are required for your 2D array. Um, this is necessary because, of course, the projection of the data, the um, location on the Earth, the latitude and longitude of uh, spatially where the grid cells are located, all of that is very important to get right. Um, so you as the user, um, have to curate this uh, in the uh, in a, a grid attribute dictionary that's part of the adders dictionary as well. Just another um, side note, because you provide the attributes in, in their own variable, um, if you're using an X-Array object, um, X-Array data arrays frequently contain attributes. Um, it's recommended that you remove those um, from your X-Array data array um, and provide them um, in the uh, ATTRS or adders uh, variable instead. Again, I'm only covering this at, at a certain level of detail um, in the interest of time, so I recommend you visit the user guide link here in this slide for more details. <clears throat> okay, so you have your Python script, you have your command, um, you're ready to run, you should immediately stop. <laughs> the best thing to do at this point is once you've written your Python script, and you can run your script outside of MET, um, just with the Python interpreter. Um, and then once you verify your Python script runs with Python, the next best thing to do is to use plot data plane. And this is for gridded data. Um, and what this does is two things. Well, actually, more than that, but two main things I use this for. Um, number one, to verify that your Python script is correctly uh, being interacted with by MET. Uh, being correctly interacted with by Matt. The second thing is to make sure that the data are placed on the map on the Earth where you expect it to be based on the attributes that you've provided for Matt to use. This is extremely critical to get right because um, there is some risk here that if you do not provide the correct attributes, the data could be placed in an area where you don't expect it to be, and the verification task um, could. Uh, you know, go awry. So it's really important here that you visualize the data um, before you actually move into your verification uh, a portion of your workflow. Um, this is always a good idea to do, even if you're not using Python embedding. Um, but it, I, I think, it's even more critical um, when you're when you're writing your own Python script um, to serve data. And here I just highlighted the two pieces. Plot data plane doesn't have a configuration file. Um, so instead of the field name entry, you just provide the name, um, and, which is your Python path and arguments on the command line um, with the appropriate uh, quotation uh, separation noted here. And then the Python keyword in place of the NetCDF or gridded data file that you would normally use. <laughs> Excuse me. OK, so let's talk um, next about point data. Um, so we've covered gridded data. Now the next thing is point data. Um, point data works a little bit different um, for Python embedding than gridded data. Um, here I've shown an example of point stat um, uh, command line call uh, to the point stat met tool. And here, um, instead of providing a, an observation uh, netcdf file or, or, or uh, 
uh, yeah, observation net CDF file it would be for point stat. We provide the Python keyword and the full path to your script with arguments as one uh, item on the command line in place of the file. Um, so it has to use double quotations um, and the keyword and then equals the path to your script with the arguments uh, uh, separated by a space. Um, and this tells the MET tool um, to obtain data from Python rather than a data file. Um, this type of invocation of Python embedding is supported by point stat, plot point obs, point to grid, and ensemble stat. So just a note, I'm using point stat for the example, um, but those other tools would be similar. Um, however, for ASCII C, um, um, we would use the dash format Python and then the path to your script with arguments instead. It works a little bit differently. I heard the um, uh, John O, um, if there's, can you just uh, address the hand raising or whatever's going on? Um, yeah, it looks like we have a chat. Um, just John HG adding a little um, commentary about running plot data plane. Uh, John, do you want to speak more to this or do you want me to cover it? Okay. Um, I'll just cover it quickly that uh, he says uh, running plot data plane with logging verbosity level four, the V4 and command line. It also prints out the naming and timing metadata, which is also good to validate. Um, just more dotting the I's, crossing the T's as you're running this plot data plane. Like you said, to make sure that everything's laid out as you expect. Yeah, yeah, thanks, John. Um, I included that in my command, but um, you know, forgot to mention it on this slide. So thanks for pointing it out. I always include that um, exactly for the reasons that John Opatz mentions, um, that uh, you know, it provides a lot of details about what Met thinks uh, the attributes of your data are um, that you're providing from Python. So. Thanks, John. That's that's great. Um, and then uh, just one other thing on point data here. Um, this is just uh, you know, in case anybody's curious, uh, for the point data, NumPy is not actually used uh, technically in this context, um, but the keyword um, is reused from the gridded data instance of Python embedding, um, just to tell uh, Met to use Python uh, for the point data um, instance. Um, just a programming note, but nothing of significance there. Okay, and then uh, similar to the gridded data case, um, I just have a compare and contrast here for how you would call point stat on the command line versus how you would uh, control it via MET plus wrappers. Um, and it's important to note that um, because the um, Python keyword and script path are all contained in one element to replace a data file instead of in two places, um, there's only one MET plus wrappers uh, configuration item that's used in this case, and it's the obs point stat input template. And the example of how it would look in your MET plus configuration file shown here, which is just MET, uh, Python numpy equals a path to your script with your arguments separated by space. Um, I don't think there's double quotes needed here. Um, if they are provided, they might be ignored or automatically parsed. I'm not quite sure, but um, I know that without the quotes, it does work. Um, in MET plus wrappers. So let's talk a little bit about your Python script and what you need to have in it um, in order to get the Python embedding to work for your point data. Um, similar to the gridded data case, we have a naming uh, requirement, and that is that your Python variable must be named point underscore data. The Python variable must be a nested Python list or a list of lists. Um, that must contain each of the 11 columns in the MET 11 column format for point observations. And for those of you who uh, have heard of this or you know, maybe have not, not uh, worked with it before, I've included it here for an example. Um, there's 11 columns listed in order here. Um, and these are the names that we typically associate with it, the data types and the description of what information is contained in each of the columns. It's important to note that your point data variable, which is a nested Python list, um, the list must be nested in the correct order. So they have to be you know, in the order shown here in the table. The TYP column has to be the first list and the outer list, SID the second and so on. Um, and I'll note that um, pandas, the, the, the Python pandas package makes the ordering and manipulating of the data easier um, inside your script uh, as a user. Um, but it's not required, and you can uh, manually create this list of lists from NumPy ND arrays or other Python objects 
um, however it's easiest for you in your Python script. And then before we go on to point stat, we're going to stop again. Um, and we have a similar tool uh, for the gridded data case, uh, but for the point observation case, and that is the plot point obs tool. Um, I think this is kind of a relatively newer tool um, in the last few versions of MET, I'm not sure. Um, but <clears throat> regardless, this is another great way, um, highly recommended to uh, do this, um, to verify that your Python script is able to pass the point observation data to MET, and MET is able to uh, put it on a map somewhere um, using the latitude and longitude. It doesn't tell you much about uh, you know, variable name and variable level and other metadata about your observations, um, but it's a good way to visualize that the, the locations of your observations are being put in the right place, and then Meta is able to execute your Python script. Um, John Halligawi might be able to say, I don't have a verbosity level listed in this sample command, but my guess is you probably want V4 um, or higher uh, in this case, which will print out lots of information um, beyond what's shown in the resulting graphic of your data on the map. Um, and again, that can be instrumental in debugging uh, how you're curating your point observation data in your Python script and verifying that um, Met is obtaining the information that you expect it to. And then uh, again, I just note the Python keyword and script arguments here um, are substituted in double quotes in place of the uh, NetCDF uh, file that would be used um, if you had a data file instead of Python. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna just take a little uh, pause before we go into the NPR data. And I just wanted to compare and contrast the gridded and point data differences. And um, I'll do my best to explain this, um, but I wanted to provide this extra detail um, given that it is the advanced uh, training series. And John Halley Gottway, um, I'd ask you to jump in and just correct me um, if I get anything wrong here. But um, <clears throat> the configuration and invocation of the Python embedding varies between the gridded data case and the point data case. And you'll see here that for the grid stack command, the Python keyword replaces the data file while the script and arguments go in the name entry for the field uh, forecast field dictionary. Um, whereas for the point or the point data case, the Python keyword and the script and arguments as a single element replace the data file. And I think this has to do with uh, how Met handles the gridded data, which is one two-dimensional uh, array at a time. And so um, and for grid stat, you want to tell it that you want to use Python in that the two-dimensional array, which is typically synonymous with a single vertical level in a 3D data file, would come from Python instead of um, a level in a, in a data file. Whereas for the observation data file, typically you have all types of observations um, in a single file, almost like a mini database of sorts. Um, and so uh, the keyword and the script replace the data file um, as one. Uh, John, do you want to add anything or is that you know sufficient? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good description. Um, the the uh, pi basically um, the Python or the the point observations are read all in one chunk from the input file, um, whereas the two D data slices are read uh, separately. So that's that's kind of why um, the the Python embedding for point observations is handled at the file name level, whereas the Python embedding of two D data slices is handled in the configuration file because you can, you know, one run of grid setter points that can process multiple 2D data files, um, but the point observations are served up in one big chunk and uh, from a file and then filtered down as they're matched to those, um, to the, for, for, as they're handled process for each verification task. Great. I don't know if that helped clarify at all. Um, well, I'll, I'll chime in as well to say that when you run plot point obs with verbosity level four, it prints out the lat long locations of where the observations occurred, um, but there is no currently no summary of the uh, variable or the the the, op, the the variable names or the observation names and levels that were found. Although we certainly could add that additional metadata or that the additional log messages to summarize that if that would be useful to validate the to validate the inputs. 
great. Maybe we can make a note of that and, uh, you know, see if there's some utility there. Thanks, John. Um, and just continuing uh, the comparing and contrasting uh, for easy reference um, as you're working with Python embedding and constructing your commands for gridded and point data, I wanted to uh, have this slide which compares and contrasts the MetPlus wrappers configuration. So just like on the last slide, the two elements of the Python embedding for the gridded case are in two different places. They're also in two different configuration items in the MetPlus wrappers. Whereas for point data, um, it's just uh, two elements as, as one observation file uh, replacement. And so there's just one MetPlus wrappers uh, configuration um, item. Okay, so uh, we'll move on from gridded and point data to MPR data. Um, this is matched pair data. And uh, before we go any farther, I just wanted to note that this is um, uh, for the stat analysis tool only, and it applies to MPR output only. Um, there are lots of different line type outputs that you can get um, from the MEP tools. Um, but in the lower right uh, corner, I've included a, an example of the MPR output format. And this is the format, the only format that's supported um, by this, uh, this, this uh, Python embedding capability right now. Um, we've had some discussions internally about supporting other uh, line type flavors, and that's certainly possible. But right now, this is the only um, functionality that exists. Um, the invocation of Python embedding here um, is via the command line switch look in, um, and we we would provide Python there, um, and then following Python, you provide the full path. Um, uh, that should be the full path to your script, um, and then any uh, command line arguments uh, that your Python script um, requires. Um, and here I've just put the uh, MetPlus wrappers uh, equivalent configuration. Here we use a model uh, n signifying the model number if you're using more than one model so typically it would just be model one um, stat analysis look in dir um, and here it's uh, python and then um, the uh, full path to your script and then the uh, uh, arguments that your script requires okay so um We'll take a break from uh, talking about the input data types and just talk about a few other things before we wrap up. Um, I just wanted to stop here and um, pause on this slide. I, I've provided this uh, slide as sort of a uh, quick resource guide, if you will, um, about getting started with Python embedding. Um, I covered a lot of it in the slides, of course. You, you're welcome to use those as, as reference. but. Um, ultimately, the Appendix F of the Met User's Guide, which I link here, um, is sort of the uh, go-to resource um, when you're sitting down to start uh, Python embedding. Um, everything you should need to know um, for using Python embedding with Met is in there. Um, the other thing I would recommend is there are simple Python embedding example scripts included with the Met installation. Um, so wherever your MET um, software is installed, there is a directory here, share MET Python examples. And there are a bunch of Python scripts that start with read. Um, and those are great um, sort of scripts that you could copy to your own area um, and modify for your data sets um, because they handle some of the conversion and naming and other requirements um, that are needed uh, already. So you just have to kind of or, or you could just use them as a reference if you want to write your own script um, from scratch. And then the other thing I would recommend highly is um, reviewing how Python embedding is used in MetPlus wrappers use cases. And I've linked here, um, this link should just take you directly to a full listing um, of all of the use cases where Python embedding is used um, for MetPlus. And we're continually adding new use cases. Um, so you know, um, if you don't see something relevant there, always check back. Um, because there's always new stuff coming on online. And then um, a few other things I wanted to cover are some special cases um, and, in, and, and additional capabilities. Um, I mentioned this earlier on in the presentation. And this special case exists where a user has access to a MET installation that uh, is Python enabled. Um, but for some reason, uh, their Python embedding script requires a Python module that was not installed in the Python version used when Matt was compiled. Um, so if Matt tries to run your script and you have an import 
at h5 pi, for example, we'll just use the H HDF5 Python library as an example. Um, you will get an error um, that it can't import the H5 Pi module if it doesn't exist in the Python that was built on, even if the Python you're using for testing um, has it. So in that case, what you wanna do is you wanna set this environment variable highlighted here in the third bullet um, called uh, metpython.exe. And you can set this to the value of the Python executable, Python 3 executable um, that you need um, to run your Python embedding script. Um, the, this isn't really recommended. The, the, best, uh, the best case is that you're able to get all the Python modules you need in the version of Python that was compiled with. And the nuance here is that um, when Met uses the Python it was compiled with, it's able to pass data in memory um, from Python back to the Met uh, code, the Met tools. Um, if you use a custom Python installation, that certainly opens the, you know, the, the realm of possibilities for all sorts of modules that you might need. Um, but what it does is it forces writing an intermediate data file, temporary data file. So uh, Met will call your Python script, your Python script will write out a data file, and then Met will read in that data file um, under the hood. Um, so uh, it's important to note that for large data sets or long workflows, this you know, it could dramatically increase the runtime depending on what you're doing in your Python script. Um, and then in those cases, you know, it's the better course of action is probably try to get um, Met compiled with a version of Python that, that suits your needs. Um, so there's more details about this in the user guide, um, and, and I'd refer you there, um, but I wanted to make sure to point this out um, because it, it is frequently used, um, I would say, uh, by users with special Python needs. Okay, and then just one more slide about some other uh, Python capabilities with, within Met Plus. Um, there are two um, additional um, Python capabilities. These are, uh, I think, specific to Met Plus wrappers um, and are different than Python embedding, um, but they provide additional ways that uh, users can leverage uh, Python scripts um, in their work, their Met Plus workflows. Um, so the first is called user script. Um, and I just provide a general description of these. I don't, uh, there's not a lot of details here, so I refer you to the user guide. Um, for Met Plus wrappers, but um, the user script allows a user to run their own Python script as part of a Met Plus wrappers workflow. Um, the script does not perform Python embedding. Um, that's not the intent here. Um, but some examples might be uh, file management prior to running Met tools. Like let's say you needed to unzip data files or move data files from one directory to another. Um, uh, something like that, you know, could be done with a user script. Um, you could do data conversion into MET compatible formats. And we'll see an example of this uh, later on in the training session this morning. Um, so the GenVX mass tool provides uh, or supports lots of different input data formats. Um, and one of those is a poly file, which is just an ASCII file with columns of latitude and longitude defining the boundary of a polygon. Um, and let's say you had another type of file, like a KML file that contained that information, um, but GenVX mask can't read the KML file to, to create the polygon. You could open the KML file with Python, uh, write out a poly file that can be used by GenVX mask, and that's not necessarily Python embedding. The Python script is just converting data from one format to another for, for MET to use. Um, and also what this can do is allow a user to perform diagnostic computations. Um, this is uh, used heavily by um, subseasonal to seasonal S2S applications of uh, Met Plus wrappers. And I think we'll be getting into that a little later in the advanced training series uh, in another few months. Um, and so I, I defer there, um, but generally speaking, um, you know, if you had a need to take output from one Met tool, uh, create a diagnostic field on that output and then call another MET tool. Um, you know, that could, you, you could put a user script in the middle of those two MET tools, or you could just use your user script standalone uh, and not call any MET tools to perform the diagnostic computation. And then the other capability I just wanted to note is um, they're called Python embedding ingest or PI embed ingest. Um, again, this is detailed in the um, MET plus uh, wrappers user guide. Um, and the intent here is to reduce the uh, Python embedding script calls when 
uh, by writing MET compatible data files to disk to be available for multiple iterations of a MET plus workflow. So <clears throat> I'll point out that this is only applicable to gridded data right now. Um, it, it does not apply to point data. I, I meant to put a bullet here, um, but just wanted to point that out. And an example here would be um, you uh, have some Python embedding for observation data uh, in a format that MET can't read. Um, and you want to verify 24 forecast leads all valid at the same time of the observations. Well, it doesn't make sense to run your observation Python embedding script 24 times because it's the observations are all the same at that valid time. So what you do is you'd run it once um, and configure MET plus wrappers to tell it when to run uh, one, once per valid time in this case. It would write out a MET compatible MET CDF file uh, observation, and it would use that file for all 24 uh, uh, you know, point stack calls or whatever, for example, um, which results in one Python embedding script call instead of 24 Python embedding script calls. And I've included two links to MET Plus uh, use cases that demonstrate each one of these capabilities. And I'd encourage you to visit those links there to uh, explore more about how they work. So I'll summarize um, the Python embedding with MET Plus. Um, it's, it's really just uh, it, 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 an, an amazing feature um, for the MET and MET Plus ecosystem. And, and it creates a customizable entry point for users into the MET tools. Um, so it's supported in MET Plus via MET Plus wrappers um, and also directly on the command line with the MET tools. Um, and we really encourage users to, to leverage this um, in their workflows, to think about new ways um, that they could expand existing workflows or new data sets that they could use um, that they've not been able to in the past. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the sky's the limit really here. Um, and, and we'd encourage everyone to reach out uh, via GitHub discussions um, if you need any assistance as you're setting up your Python embedding um, or if you have any follow on questions um, from this uh, session. But um, I, think, I think I left a few minutes. Maybe we could have a question or two. Um, otherwise, we can move on to the next uh, portion. Yeah, Daniel, this is John Rapey. Hi. Hi. I appreciate gr the great discussion here. It's very helpful. And I'm running, uh, essentially doing Python embedding, but my MET instance is up on a HPC where I'm using the container. And so I, so I basically ended up using the environment variable to direct the, uh, to the Python instance that I have, which is a Python that I installed myself up on the HPC. Uh, so I'm assuming that that container doesn't have the uh, Python installed inside of it to access it. Is that correct? Um, if you installed your Python on the HPC and not in the container, then then yes. Um, but I don't have a ton of experience with containers, so I defer to somebody from the team on the call who might be able to provide more details about containers and HPC. Hi, uh, John, this is John Um So if you're using a Docker container, um, and I realize you're running it through Singularity or Aptainer probably, um, yes. the, there is an instance of Python um, that is compiled inside of that container along with the MET code. So um, you could use Python embedding with that instance uh, that's in, inside the MET container, um, theoretically. There's a lot of things that could go wrong um, as far as make, making all that work. Um, but that I would recommend, uh, if you're able to run, like log into the container and run an interactive uh, bash shell to test things out, that's where I would recommend uh, starting. Um, but yeah, if you log into the container with a bash shell and do which Python, you should find it installed and user local. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I the only reason I'm considering that is because of the uh, increased work uh, computer time for a lot big jobs. And that was mentioned earlier by Daniel. So I'm thinking about that. But right now, the environment variable is working very successfully. I mean, I was able to use Python embedding 
And another question I had was the the Python script that I'm using uh, has it's a Met, MetPy uh, script that produces uh, uh, interpolated fields such as Barnes analysis, Pressman analysis, uh, radial basis function analysis. For e if I run that script in a Python embedding situation, uh, I have each array as output, and the array is named Met. I believe it's metadata. You might correct me on that one. I forgot what the name of that is, but the array is actually named something so that Met will recognize it. Mine is an MD array. Uh, there it is, metadata. Mm -hmm. uh, I ha if the script is producing multiple analysis, like Barnes, Cressman, and so forth, and I name each one of those metadata, um, my my fear was that I would throw the same array multiple times and it wouldn't go through. But so I restricted my uh, script to only write out the one metadata array, say for a Cressman analysis alone, so that there would be no confusion. Can I run multiple? Can I output all those different types of interpolation at the same time, or would that be a uh, create an error? Um, I'm not sure. What I, I don't think it would work. Um, I'm not sure what error would happen or not. My guess is that Met would use the last encountered object in your script named Met data. So if you did Crestman and then Barnes and then radial basis, and radial basis was the last one, the radial basis would be the one that Met would use. I, I, I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, but this is an interesting question and my guess is the 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 current answer would be that you would probably want a python script for each barnes cressman and radial basis and you would think about that like three data fields from an input data file right um mm -hmm. i'm not sure what tool you're using um maybe a grid stat yes um, yeah. stat. so so looking here i think you'd have multiple name entries um you know, and you would pass an, a command line argument telling it which interpolation from MetPy you wanted to do. So you'd have one name for your script with Barnes as an argument, one name for your script with Cressman, and one name for your script with radial basis. And I think somebody raise their hand. Maybe I'm going off into the weeds here, but I think that would get get you what you needed. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in and, and agree with Dan that. Um, you know, the Python embedding of 2D data serves up exactly one field of 2D data for each run. Um, that being said, I definitely recommend writing a single Python script to handle this and just have it take a command line argument to indicate which field of data you want the Python script to return. So you would have one Python script, you would call it uh, four times, with four different arguments to indicate the data that you want to extract, use Python to to compute. And then, uh, John, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, John asking the question. Um, <laughs> uh, you would then use your command line argument to populate the name in your adders dictionary. So later on in stat files and everything, you would be able to distinguish between Barnes and Pressman and, you know, um, whichever. Yeah, yeah. Good question. And this yeah. this sounds like a good use case. I'm wondering, Dan, uh, how would John Raby go about contributing this back? Um, you know, I think uh, you could start a Met Plus discussion and we could, you know, go from there um, and, and help guide John into, you know, some of the contributors guide. And I think this would be a great example. You know, it uses MetPy, which is a really popular package for a lot of our users, um, has a lot of capability. And I like the, um, you know, the uh, uh, objective analysis uh, applications you have. I think that's, that's interesting um, from the Barnes and Cressman type things. So yeah, we welcome it for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me see if I can work up something and then enter it via discussion. Yeah, I, I also say that the user's guide was really helpful. That's where I learned the basics, and you you presented that. 
but the user's guide was really helpful for being able to figure out uh, how to do the embedding. And then I think I had a subsequent discussion that was very helpful too. Awesome. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, this is Tara. Um, I'm actually going to put John Raby um, on the the um, hot seat uh, uh, again, or um, ask you to. Um, can you share with us um, the the challenge that you're um, now facing as far as um, observation data sets and um, you know what you're trying to evaluate? Because I think it it would be good for not only our team but um, other folks that are on here to hear about the data sets that um, you know we're we're trying to. Um, bring into MEP Plus and, and what Python embedding might help with. So do you mind talking about your um, your LES evaluation data set? It's something that I can't really get into a lot of detail about, but basically it's uh, I'm trying to uh, uh, use point observations from a local tower array. And then the idea would be to take those point observations and then produce a set of gridded observations from that and then use that gridded observation data set to use to uh, produce spatial verification output from uh, GridStat and other MET tools. And that's kind of a summary uh, of it, but it's that's kind of my goal. Yeah, and this is um, fairly high temporal resolution. So it's, you know, it's uh, definitely, um, you know, le less than a, a few minutes um, resolution. So there's there's a lot of data there. Um, I, I'm raising my hand again, John, because um, I, I did want to point out that um, we do have a, um, within the DTC a development task to do something kind of somewhat similar um, uh, using output from what is called a single column model, um, which is, you know, part of, you know, doing testing from, you know, very, uh, very basic um, principles all the way out to, you know, fully coupled um uh model runs and, and so forth and and um we we're going to be working with a handful of um output from single column model runs and, and doing kind of what you're talking about i think stitching together um almost like a, a gridded data set from these you know fairly high temporal and spatial resolution um output data sources and then trying to do evaluation so um Knowing that that that's that that's a little bit of a description of what you're trying to do, um, mm -hmm. let's try and, and um, stay in contact with regard to that, so that when we start working on um, our um, project, it might actually be able to to feed back to you and, and help you out. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, I'll stay in touch. Thanks. Okay, um, any other questions for me quick? Um, I, I'm imagining we need to move on, um, but uh, my email uh, is at the end of the slides, which we will share. Uh, GitHub discussions I'm plugged into, so I'll see anything there. Um, and certainly the team can can put, put me in touch with anybody, but um, I'll just say thank you again. Um, and if there's any quick questions, we can answer them. Otherwise, move on. Okay, John Opatz. Sure. Um, okay, thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate uh, your presentation and hopefully everybody got a lot out of it. It was actually fantastic, especially hearing it again. Not a lot of the things that I think a lot of beginner and intermediate um, Python users in MEP Plus kind of mess up on or contact us. So hopefully everybody here got something from it. Um, and if not, these presentations will be online so you can review it again in your own time. Um, but again, thanks, Dan, for that. Uh, now, I think we're going to move over to George's presentation, who's going to give kind of a live action version. Um, so uh, just a little context, Amanda, from two weeks ago or from our last session, uh, signed on and talked a little bit about how um, Filer Weather is in very disparate data sources and data sets and data types um, and gave a little bit about how um, she works with that currently, um, and she provided our team with a um, some KML files um, that had data sets that were not ready or not native ingested into MET+. Plus. But through kind of the brilliant teams that we have here, we were able to use Python to ingest them and push them into GridStat and actually create output. And 
George will give us kind of a layout of how that was done and how those, um, how, what that Python script looks like and how it runs. So George, if you're ready, by all means, um, take we over. Wanna, do we want to take a short break? Oh, yeah, it is 9.58. Wow, I didn't realize. I thought we were closer to 9.40. Yes, sorry, George, getting you all prepped for that. Um, let's, uh, let's take a 10-minute break, I think, um, and report back at 9.10, if that's all right with everyone. Sounds good to me. OK, excellent. All right, thanks, everybody. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Uh, jumping back from our 10-minute break. Hopefully, everybody's made their way back to their uh, desktops or laptops. Um, as you can see from the presentation already pulled up, uh, George is going to give a kind of brief overview of the Fireweather MEPLUS use case and what it took to get that data set in its previous form into a format that MEPLUS can understand. George, sorry for uh, getting you started before we were jumping onto the break, but it's all you this time. Uh, no problem. Thanks, John. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is George McCabe. I'm a software engineer of the MetPlus team. Um, and I'm going to talk about a MetPlus use case example that I put together um, using some fire weather data um, and using a few of the uh, Met tools um, or Met functionality that we've discussed um, earlier in this session. Um, so uh, in this example, um, the inputs that we have uh, were provided are a KML file that contains the fi fire perimeter area. Um, it's just an uh, XML, sim similar to XML, uh, but contains a list of lat, lawn, and elevation points that define the area around where the um, the, fi the fire um, was was observed. Um, and then uh, um, for the, the forecast data, we have a, a wharf fire net CDF file. Um, Met is able to read certain WARF input files, uh, but this file is um, is a, a staggered file, and so it is actually not able to be read by MET natively. Um, and so in this example, we will use Python embedding to read that data into um, the MET tools. Um, so here is an excerpt from the use case configuration file that we've put together. Um, it has a process list running three tools. So there's a user script then the Gen VX mask tool, and then the GridStat tool. Um, and we're running um, three different valid times here that we've defined in the valid list. Um, most typically use cases um, contain a valid begin, end, and increment to define evenly spaced intervals um, to process. But in this case, the, the date, sample data that we were provided um, were not even. And so um, this is a nice uh, tool that allows you to uh, define uneven intervals of valid times to process. And I'll get into the details of these components uh, coming up here. Um, so here I'll talk about the user script. Um, I've removed um, all but the relevant config variables here so that it's uh, a little easier to see what's going on. Um, so with the user script, and I, I'll make a note, um, in this example, we're running a Python script. In many of our examples, we do run Python scripts. Uh, but the user script functionality can be used to run any command that you could run in the shell. Um, so any sort of shell commands, command line tools, um, you know, any other applications that are not provided with MET um, can be used here. Um, we typically just use Python because we're familiar with writing simple scripts using that, and it's, a, it's an easy way to get something going quickly. Um, so the two main relevant variables for a user script um, MET plus use case is um, the user script runtime frequency that defines how often you will be running the script. Um, so you may have a script that you want to run just once and do some sort of pre-processing um, or post-processing or intermediate processing. Uh, but in this case, we want to run the script once per, for each of the um, valid times that we will, we will be processing. Um, so that setting needs to be set to run once for each to, um, to do that. And then the user script command is the variable that's used to actually run the command. Um, so here we have a call to Python, um, and then the path to a script called find, find and read fire perimeter poly.py. And then we'll pass in a few arguments, the input directory to search, um, the current valid time of the run, and the output directory. Um, so notice here we have this valid, um, what we call file template tags. 
And that's um, since we've have have it configured to run once for each runtime, um, it will run this for each of the valid times we defined and substitute the current valid time for that tag. Um, these other variables down here are um, I I made them up um, I, that you can create any variables that you'd like if it makes it easier um, to build your command. So instead of typing everything out in this user script command, I created a path to where the scripts live and the input and output directories. Um, that just makes things a little bit cleaner when you're looking at the, the use case configuration. Uh, I also like to do things with um, with the output directory. If, if I'm calling another tool after this that will read output from there, then I like to reference that same output directory as the input directory of the next tool so that I make sure that it's the same path. And if I need to make updates, I only need to update them once. Um, so here, um, we have this KML file again with the coordinates, and then we pass that to the user script, which runs a Python script, which generates this polyline file, um, which is just um, a series of latlon points. Um, the reason we're doing this is, um, so I originally when I, I saw this file, I thought, oh, this is a list of points I should use Python embedding with some um, point observation tool. Uh, but then I realized that these points are actually, they're not individual points that we're interested in. They're defining a perimeter around an area. Um, and so um, my my next thought was that GenVX mask would be a good tool to use so I can create a mask file to, to say if is it in the fire area or not in the fire area. Um, and there's a few different inputs that GenVX mask, Gen mask expects. Uh, one of them is this poly file. And so I essentially parsed this file and generated a poly file that can be read into Gen VX mask. Um, so now we'll talk about the actual Gen VX mask call. Um, here we have um, input template defines um, either a gridded fi file or a grid definition. Um, this is what's used to, to map the data. Um, so here we have a, a string that's defined a, a Lambert conformal projection. Um, there's a few ways to to do a lot of these things that we're doing here. Um, so another option is I could have taken the um, the wharf file and run a Python pi embed ingest instance, which essentially calls regrid data plane to create a, a met file on a grid. Um, and then I can pass that file into GenVX mask as the grid definition. Um, that for this ex example, this works fine if, if I'm defining this the grid by hand. Uh, but in other cases, say if you have many different files you're going to process and they have different grid, de grid definitions, you may want to do something like that where you create a file and then use that file, the forecast file, as your grid definition for the OBS to make sure that they um, are consistent. Um, so in here we also defined a mask. And the mask is, um, is this poly file that we created from the user script. Um, and then we define an output directory of where to write this mask netcdf file. Um, then the options for GenVX mask, we'd say it's a, the type of input that we're reading is poly um, because that's the format that we created in our previous step. Um, so here's a little example of how that works. So we pass in this poly file we created and the grid definition string into GenVX mask and we get a met formatted netcdf mask file. Um, and so this contains some some grid definitions in here. Um, you may notice that there is no timing information here. Um, that's because mask files do not have timing information. Um, and so in that case, we'll need to set some settings to override values to tell um, the subsequent tool that um, this, this file is valid for a certain time. Um, so, which leads us to grid stat. Um, so here we have, um, we will define forecasts and observation data. Um, so here, similar to Dan's example earlier, we have the input template set to Python NumPy, which is a keyword that tells us that we're using Python embedding to read forecast data into the tool. Um, and then the observation input template is the same value as the GenVX mask output template. Um, that makes things a little easier um, to, to make sure that we're using the correct path for that. Um, and then we define an output directory to write our data out. And this output template uh, can contain file name, um, file name template tags. And so here we'll create a directory with the valid time, year, month, hour, and day um, 
to to organize our data a little better. Um, then there's some other settings to define the model and op type that will go into the output stat files. Um, and then here, our forecast var1 name, um, instead of passing the name to a, a field, we'll insert the call to our Python embedding script with our arguments. Um, that will read from this directory, and it will pass in, we'll also pass in the valid time um, that'll be used to find the correct file. Um, and then we'll also use a threshold of greater than 0.5. And then for the observation data, we'll pass in the um, the poly or sorry the, the mask netcf file that we created from GenVX mask. So that the field name that we created is fire fire perimeter, um, and then we'll define the star comma star, which means it's a two D um, volume of data that we'll um, re read in from a netcdf file. Uh, the threshold will say equal to one, so all these values should be zero or one because they're a, a mask. And then the, in these additional options, we'll set the, um, you, we'll call set atter valid, which sets the valid attribute. And so that forces um, the current valid time that we're processing to be interpreted as the valid time. And that will make sure that our data is um, paired up properly. Um, here we use the regrid um, to grid value. We set, say that we want to, um, regrid our data to the forecast grid. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if we had passed in our um, our WARF file uh, that that is in MET format um, as as the grid definition for GenVXMS, then we wouldn't have to do this regridding step because we'd be confident that the data is on the same grid. Uh, but since we did a, a hard coded um, grid grid specification string and then have the Python embedding pull data out of the the input file to determine the grid for that, there, it could be slightly off with some rounding differences. And so we wanna make sure that we regrid the data to the same grid. Um, and then these other flags, um, there's some output flags that tell it which type of uh, statistics to add to our stat file. Um, and then the NP NC pairs flag will say, uh, set lat long to true, that will generate a netcdf output file. Um, here is an excerpt from the Python embedding script, the read wharf out fire. Um, so it, it reads the data using X-Array and then pulls out the important information and calculates things like the valid time, init time, forecast lead, um, so on. And we make sure that we set the name so that we can reference it. And then the grid information, and that's all generated here, pulled from data from that file. Um, so here's a little diagram to show what's going on here. So we'll read in this wharf fire netcdf file as our forecast data, and we'll pass it to gridstat using the Python embedding script. So it's read directly in using that Python script. And then we'll also pass in as our observation data, the met formatted netcdf mask file that we generated in that previous step. Um, and we'll pass those to gridstat. And that will generate two output files because of our, our settings. We'll have a stat file that has a, a set of statistics. It's a little hard to read here because it's wrapped, but it's, um, you get the idea. And then a met netcdf file. Um, and here are some ncview excerpts from that. So we can see there's the forecast area and the observation area, and then the diff area so we can see where it has overlapped. Um, and that's all I have here. Um, I'll open it up to any questions. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, George. Appreciate your um, your presentation on this. Uh, and as you mentioned, all the stuff showing the forecast area, obs area, and diff area, especially on this last slide. Um, this is going to be kind of important because as we transfer to our next, next speaker, we're going to go over what exactly that means and what that can be used and how that all is uh, plays a part in the verification of fire weather. So without much further ado, um, our next speaker um, is Amanda from last week um, showing us a little bit more, like I said, about the results of this uh, real-time Python embedding example. Uh, Amanda, are you all ready to present? Okay, great. Thanks, John. Uh, 
I just want to say how excited I am that these data got into Met Plus and um, the great work that John, George, and Dan did to get this use case put together. Um, this, this is huge uh, for me personally uh, for doing this work. I was pretty a easily able to use Met Plus for the weather portion of the WARF fire forecast, which if you attended the previous session, uh, I had some examples of, but um, being able to use Met Plus for this piece of the forecast, specifically the fire spread, is really exciting. So uh, a little review if you were here at the previous session or um, just some information if you were not. Uh, fire data is very challenging, uh, as John mentioned earlier. When we use weather data, either forecasts or observations, uh, we're really used to consistency. And uh, you, you might not agree with me because there, of course there are always issues, but compared to wildfire data, the weather is pretty consistent. It's modeled worldwide. The grids are usually regular and it's always occurring. So if I want to get some really robust statistics on my model performance, I could run several months, several years worth of forecasts to do comparisons for. And across the world, there's regular observations in most areas and Many of these op observing stations are held to specific standards. If we think of some of the WMO standards for synoptic observations or uh, ASOS here in the US, kind of our gold standard weather stations that are regularly maintained. And then also, if I'm interested in doing some verification, there are regular repositories where these data are available, especially here in the United States. So for example, if I just wanted to run Met Plus to see how it worked. If I wanted to use it for an application, I could go up on a NOAA repository and pull some PER forecasts for a couple days. And then I could jump onto the uh, research database that NCAR maintains and pull some stage four precipitation observations. And it would all run through really nicely. And that would give me a good example of um, just getting some experience running MET+. Plus. But Unfortunately, wildfire data isn't like that. When we're looking at fire, we're usually modeling it only at the location of the fire. So we have a really small spatial extent and wildfire occurs really uh, without any warnings usually. Um, we might know that it's a critical day, but until that fire actually ignites, we don't have any information on that. We don't have any data. and when the fires are occurring uh, on the observation side, we're not really getting those regular standard observing at certain intervals. We're, we're getting observations that are for a different purpose, which is for the responders to tactically apply the data. So I might get a wind observation in the vicinity of the fire when the uh, one of the fire chiefs calls an incident meteorologist and says, hey, I need a wind observation at your location. And that might get written down somewhere, it might not, but the fire chief needs it to keep his crew safe and to uh, organize the response to the fire. So the goal isn't to provide consistent observations for verification purposes of models, it's to respond to the fire and keep everybody safe. So in that line, they're only taken when they're needed at areas where they're needed uh, for that response. And uh, having some sort of standardization or archiving those data is not at the forefront of the uh, responders' minds. So data might be archived. If they are, there's a lot of different databases where we find those data. It varies by fire and uh, one time I was asking one of our stakeholders for our Colorado Fire Prediction System project where I could find a, a certain type of data. And he said he thought it was in uh, on paper and filing cabinets west of Fort Collins, uh, which is difficult when you're just trying to verify your model. So having that inconsistency with the number of databases or uh, different fires having different sets of data, lacking those observations. Uh, usually we can go 24 hours or more between fire perimeters, which is difficult if you're trying to verify an 18 hour forecast of war fires, um, fire spread of the fire. 
some variables like flame length we don't even have any observations of. And then there's also some in inaccuracies. We might have an incorrect ignition location uh, even outside of the observed fire perimeter. And then one issue we ran into in the past was uh, issues with unit labeling. We had ignition times that were labeled as being in UTC, but after we did some digging, we discovered that they were actually local time, but labeled as UTC. So we're about six hours off in the ignition of all our fires, which severely affected the type of weather that was happening that the warp was modeling. So these are the kind of quality and availability issues we run into with these data. And because we're just kind of grabbing whatever we can get our hands on, and it's, it's a different type of uh, modeling, a different type of observation, it's not super quick to get it into MET+. Uh, so the work George just showed uh, was necessary, but at the end, it, quite straightforward to be able to get these unusual data sets into the framework of MET+. Just a little more information about the files that were used. The forecast data files were from the WERF fire model, which is a couple model of WERF as the atmospheric portion of the model. And then there's a fire spread uh, piece of it that can feed back into the weather portion of the model. For this particular case, it was initialized at, on the 1st of June at 16 UTC. This was specifically for the 416 fire that occurred in Southern Colorado. The net CDF file had a domain of 117 by 117, but that also contained a subgrid that was 472 by 472. So the resolution of each of those were approximately 111 meters and 27 meters. Our fire area was on the subgrid and defined as a fraction of the cell area that was on fire from zero to one. So I know when I tried to read this data into MET Plus in the past, um, rather than using Python, I was trying to use the unified post processor and it was difficult for me to uh, try to run this unusual case through that uh, and not understanding that code very well. So the Python embedding was really key to be able to get this uh, staggered and subgrid file into the MET+. Our observation file, as George mentioned, was a keyhole markup language or KML format file. Similar to a shape file that is used in GIS, uh, if you use Google Earth, uh, KML is kind of the standard file used to uh, create maps on Google Earth. The file points contained a perimeter of the fire that was observed by the multi-mission aircraft or MMA operator. The MMA flies over a fire when the state has access to it and is able to deploy it, uh, depending on resources and size of the fire and kind of what's going on. There's an infrared camera on that fire that's used to image it from above. And then there's an operator sitting in the aircraft that will manually trace the outline of that heat signature to produce that perimeter. There are some softwares becoming available that can do this more automatically, but really for, for this case and cases around that time frame, uh, it, it was manually drawn and then put into a KML file. So for this example, we had three files that were available during the run. Example of what this might look like um, for our 20 UTC perimeter, the first one we had of the three uh, on the left, just NC view of what the or fire prediction of fire spread looked like with the red blob in the middle being a value of one and then values that are not quite 100% on fire, mostly on the outside there. And then on the right is the observed perimeter from the MMA from approximately the same time. Uh, north of Hermosa down there. So just quick reminder of what George presented for the workflow. Um, first, the user script was used to convert the observed perimeters from the KML into a poly file that could then be read into the Gen VX mask. And then that's how we were able to have an observation. Uh, once we had that observation, the grid stat with Python embedding to read the WERF fire output file was used. 
And then we were able to output contingency statistics through GridStat. Uh, unlike some other variables that are more continuous, this is really just a binary yes, no, either there's fire or there isn't. So getting the contingency statistics from GridStat was the most uh, useful for this application. So just a, again, a NCV output of what the Gen VX mask uh, step looks like. On the left is the original KML fire plotted on Google Earth, and then uh, the corresponding NetCDF file that was produced using the Gen VX mask in the polyline file. So just some results. Uh, first, using that uh, paired NetCDF file that George presented at the end of his talk to get a kind of an overview of how, in general, the model performed. So as I mentioned, we have three times where we had observations. This was a, a special run that we did that was more than 18 hours of the typical uh, fire prediction system run because of the sparsity of the uh, perimeter observations, uh, just the nature of taking observations around a fire. So the first was June 1st at 20 UTC. That's approximately four hours after ignition. Then we had uh, June 2nd at 15 UTC, so not quite 24 hours later. And then a third perimeter at zero UTC on June 3rd. Uh, we see the fire spreading through these time periods. On the top is the observed in the darker color. And then the red that's on the southern end of the output is the WERF fire uh, model response. And then in the middle where we have this blank area is the intersection of the two. So there's some issues uh, we see. Uh, first of all, for the at the beginning, we're fire spreading a little more to the east than the observed fire, but certainly not catching that northerly progression. Um, that that's a the the fire's sort of going that direction from the forecast, as we can see from the intersection area, but not quite far enough to the northwest there. At the next time period in the middle we have a lot of southern extent of the forecast that is not captured in the observation and again not really progressing as far north as possible though it appears there might be some more overlap here and then uh, on the far right for the last observation where the forecast is starting to get more at that northerly portion of the observed fire but there's a lot of false alarm to the south so if I was following up on this case, I would probably turn to the atmospheric portion and uh, run some MetPlus statistics on how well the wind speed and direction was performing in the model. Uh, I would also want to look at the terrain, see if there's some feature of the terrain there uh, that might be impacting. And another thing to keep in mind is that where fire does not incorporate human intervention. So it's possible because Hermosa, the town of Hermosa is south of this fire, that there was more of an attack and response on the south, south, southern portion of the fire than there was on the northern portion. And so in addition to errors in the model, some of the southern extent could have been prevented by human uh, in the firefighter response rather than an issue with the model. So all these things need to be kept in mind when looking at fire spread verification. The real power, I think, of using GridStat for such an example of this is getting those contingency statistics uh, calculated and plotted out, not just for this case, but hopefully for multiple cases um, in the future. So if you're not familiar with this type of plot, this is a performance diagram. It takes advantage of the relationship between different contingency statistics um, to give kind of a quick overview of performance. So on the x-axis, we have the success ratio, which is one minus the false alarm. So a success ratio of one means that there are no false alarms in the forecast. On the left, uh, the y-axis is, is the probability of detection from zero to one. A uh, value of one would mean all of the observed events were also forecast in the model. 
the curved lines are critical success index from 0.1 in the lower left to 0.9 in the most upper right line that's visible. And then the dashed diagonal lines are bias, with a bias of one going uh, in the one-to-one -one of the plot. And then as we go left of that one-to-one -one line, bias increases as is labeled on the top of the plot and then bias decreases going below that line. So at the end of the day, your best performance is in the upper right. That's what you're kind of aiming for. So I plotted the results of grid stat on the performance diagram for my three lead times, four hours in a circle, 23 in the triangle, and 32 in the square. So we see in quantitative way now what we saw in the uh, the pairs in the overlay in the previous slide where the first lead time of four hours is underperforming probability detection is only about 0.3 uh, there's not a ton of false alarms but a little bit with some of that southern extent and then uh, the bias is about 0.5 so under forecasting the spread of the fire in those early hours when we move to 23 hour lead time in the triangle, we slightly increased the probability of detection, but maintained about the same CSI because the false alarms are increased from that southern expansion we saw in the previous slide. And then again, for 32 hours at the square, uh, probability of detection much increased, getting up towards 0.8. That is some increase in the CSI, but our bias is about two now, and um, that's most likely due to all those false alarms in the south where the fire is now over predicted in comparison to what was observed. So from this case, we see that the Python embedding and the user script are very useful tools for being able to take these types of atypical data sets and turn them into the type of gridded files that MetPlus can accept. And then we can use the grid tool for a quick analysis of the fire perimeter forecast versus observations. And kind of looking bigger picture, I also really like the consistency where in the past we were basically doing this calculation by hand. We were overlaying the WARF fire and the observed KML files on top of each other in a GIS application and calculating the area differences. And that, that can be prone to human error. Whereas once I set up my MetPlus workflow for the grid stat tool, I know that every case I run through that tool will be analyzed in the same way. And I can trust those con consistent statistics. And I can also do comparisons over a large number of cases, uh, hopefully with uh, a little less overhead and manual work than how we were looking at this previously. And then just also looking forward, this is kind of a first step for one of the major goals of the project we're working on to incorporate the FHIR um, data into MetPlus, where we want to look at object-based verification tools, especially the mode time domain, so that we can get up not just the yes no contingency statistics of the fire burn area but also what direction is the fire spreading and how fast is it spreading in the forecast versus the observations our stakeholders at the state of colorado for the fire prediction system project indicated that this was most important to them they didn't really care if the fire was over predicted which happened a lot with the worst fire system what they wanted to know was what direction is it moving and how fast is it moving so they know where to deploy their resources and also from a safety perspective if there's going to be a sudden change in direction of the fire or some gusty winds are coming up in the near term they want to be able to get their teams out of there to keep them safe so that's all i had um, for this presentation happy to take any questions or discussion points
Yeah, John. Uh, yes, so I wanted to ask you a question about the uh, graphic that you showed where you're showing the objects, forecast objects and the uh, observed objects. And uh, if you have that slide, yeah. Yes, that one. Uh, are these, uh, were those produced using the net CDF output of GridStat? Yes. Um, so in George's presentation, he indicated there were two outputs. There were the stat files, which contained the contingency statistics, and then there was the net CDF output. And these were created from that net CDF output. There were three variables in there. There was the forecast area, the observed area, and then the one I'm showing here, which is the comparison between the two. So these are... Uh not sure what settings you had for the configuration file but these would be uh, these were subject to smoothing uh, in the process of running gridstat I'm, I'm assuming that i think it was uh nearest neighbor i don't i don't have the config file in front of me um george or anyone else who ran the case what was there any neighborhood smoothing done um, I didn't set any neighborhood settings besides the defaults, um, I, but it did regrid the observation data to the forecast domain. Yeah, so there wasn't any smoothing done, it, but there was that regridding step where the observations were regridded to the forecast. Uh, okay, thanks. I was just curious about that. Um, I, I don't know. There is a way that you can set the configuration file so it doesn't smooth the fields. Uh, John John Halley Gotway probably knows more about that, but I don't know if that rendering without any smoothing would, would show any different results. But anyway, it's something to think about. Yeah, just with my familiarity from the 416 case, this doesn't look like there's really any smoothing done, just maybe a a little bit on the observations from the regridding step, um, but you're a hundred percent right that wh whether you do some smoothing or not can have a huge impact, especially on a case like this, where your resolution is uh, so high. You know, we have a thirty meter resolution on the model, and it's such a small area as well. Thanks. Okay, so John O, do you have anything else that you wanted to cover other than what I was going to cover? Nope. I was actually going to ask if you thought we had enough time. It's ten forty-seven. We got about thirteen minutes left. Yeah, I mean, I I, I just like to do a little bit of a wrap up and and talk about um, you know, what else is is going to be uh, wor what we're going to be working on, um, and then you know what um, uh, trainings are coming up. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Of course, it's all you. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been talking primarily about, um, you know, short range weather type of, of fire um, evaluation. Um, and once again, just calling out the support for this particular training series is um, both from the NOAA bilateral infrastructure law funding um, that we have, as well as Amanda's um, JTTI project. So we really appreciate that. Um, and then moving forward um, through the next rounds of our training series, um, a lot of that support is, is coming from um, the bill as well as um, the Unified Forecast System Research to Operations um, project that is looking at um, S2S and, and seasonal forecast system um, prediction and so forth. So um, in order to kind of tie things together uh, for the, the last three sessions of this advanced training series, which will happen in the, in the winter, um, you know, we will still be looking at um, predictors um, for uh, sub-seasonal uh, and to seasonal type of um, fire weather, you know, trying to determine what the fire weather um, situation may look like um, on a seasonal basis, as well as some of those indices. 
And uh, if I go ahead and um, move forward. I do want to though, um, actually give an example of what Amanda was kind of talking about um, with regards to using mode and objects and spread and and so forth and and what we what we feel we should be able to do um, with uh, you know any, any kind of um, fire spread that that's coming out of like a short range prediction, but um, could actually be useful you know in, in the longer terms as well, which is. Um, so over here on the, the right hand side is is just a an example of um predicted fire spread um uh for one of um uh amanda's cases i think it was um the the first one you were talking about uh i think in april amanda i, I'm, I can't remember sorry about that but if you were to um look at each one of these um uh you know uh lines of of equal time basically um you would wind up having um objects that are identified through time. So, you know, you've got your immediate, um, the initial um, fire, and then where it's going to, to spread, moving to the north and, and south and, and so forth. And if you think of each one of those as, as basically an object that's kind of sweeping out its own little um, two-dimensional or actually three-dimensional um, space-time object of um, X, Y, and time, um, then you can follow these objects through time. And so, um, what we're what we're hoping to be able to do is to be able to follow, um, you know, the, these spread objects um, using mode time domain, um, and and you know, this is kind of maybe what it would look like um, as far as as those um, those different uh, objects go. And then, what you can get from um, mode time domain is not only um, you know how quickly things are spreading, but how long um, you know the the, um, the event is lasting as well, so duration. So that might um, also help the, the forecasters with understanding, you know, how quickly things are spreading, um, as well as, you know, uh, velocity. Sorry, this is kind of the wrong color. It's blue on blue, but it, it does say velocity over there, so you can get, you know, how fast things are moving, as well as, um, you know, where the, the spread um, is centered, you know, the centroid, because once again, you know, spread does change depending on, on how the wind structures occur and so forth. So just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of how, how we might be able to use um, some of our more advanced techniques um, for uh, fire spread. And that's gonna be part of the JTTI project that Amanda was talking about. Um, and then if you're thinking longer term for um, sub-seasonal to seasonal, once again, um, I'm reiterating um, one of the images that, that we had last um, training series. Uh, you know, just pulled some ideas from the fire weather test bed, things that they're going to be looking at. Um, and, you know, for, for um, sub-seasonal to seasonal, clearly, um, you know, having a sense of temperature, precipitation, um, you know, whether, whether there's equal chances for that or, or if you're going to be, um, you know, moving into a drought situation or if, if it's going to be, you know, um, fairly wet and, and so forth. Uh, understanding um, those are, are important. And um, some of plus does have, you know, the ability to, to um, do those evaluations right now. Um, we are also working once again with um, projects to, to um, you know, work with um, things like fuel content, soil moisture, you know, land surface model um, and, and so forth. Um, and then, you know, longer term for um, sub-seasonal to seasonal is, you know, looking at the emissions and how that impacts, um, you know, the, the global um, environment as well. So um, just really quickly, um, right now we do have uh, MET plus use cases that, that do address some aspects of this. And over the next six months, um, you know, more will be added. Um, for example, um, for Air quality and composition, we're working right now with a collaboration that's between NOAA, um, which developed many years ago um, the Monet Python-based package to um, read in a, um, a lot of different um, atmospheric um, air quality, atmospheric composition um, observation sources. And then um, now they're working um, with a, a Python wrapper around that, kind of similar to MET Plus called Melodies um, for doing specifically um, air quality atmosphere composition um, evaluation. So we're working with that team to to bring their um, their capability into the MET Plus um, framework to allow for being able to do more data ingest of, of all those different observation types. Um, we have uh, three different projects right now that we're working with um, land surface modelers on. 
to um, bring in support for, you know, some of the basic, um, uh, you know, file formats, um, Ameriflux, FluxNet, um, Mesonets, um, satellite-based um, observations, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, in fact, one of our, our projects is even looking at um, drought indices, which, um, you know, over the next six months will become, you know, very helpful for looking at not only um, sub-seasonal to seasonal, but also, um, you know, the, the fire weather aspects of things. And then right now we do have 17 um, use cases that are focused on sub-seasonal to seasonal um, evaluation and looking at indices and looking at things like MJO and ENSO and and um, and so forth. And then um, we will be um, doing our, our um, next round of, of um, training on some seasonal to seasonal as well as the seasonal forecast evaluation system that right now we're testing out on Amazon Web Service, but then also I'm um, planning on getting set up um, on NOAA HPCs as well as the NCAR um, HPC and so forth. So um, with that, um, our winter schedule, um, Right now, we were tentatively starting um, talking about restarting on January 10th with um, seasonal to sub seasonal to seasonal and SFS. Um, I have a feeling that may be delayed by about a month because we're running into some delays on getting the, the SFS system implemented, and we want to make sure that that's good to go before we start, you know, doing training and so forth. But we do have three sessions um, that are um, tentatively set for January and February that will likely move to February into March. Um, um, focused on S2S, SFS, as well as looking at things like the aerosols and the land surface um, that can also be helpful for fire weather um, on the seasonal um, time frame. So that's all I, I wanted to do is I just kind of wanted to wrap things up and let you know what's coming. And uh, we have four minutes. Are there any other questions that people may have? I guess no more questions. So do you want to go ahead and wrap it up, John? Sure can. Um, as it was already noted, um, we got we got our upcoming uh, session be moving in January. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us and sitting in on a little bit more fire weather. Um, and again, appreciate everything you've been doing. And uh, we will see you in the new year. So uh, thanks, everybody. Um, we, will, uh, we will reconvene. And there will be more notices given out as we get closer to that date. And as we know a little bit more about when the, the delay shifts our subseasonal to seasonal forecast system, we will distribute that by email. And it, if you've already subscribed to the calendar, that will be updated for you. So a little bit more push to uh, subscribe to it if you haven't. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, we will see you later. Thanks.